Oh, okay. That's right. Um, yeah, and then also, let's see. Um, ben and Scarlett went... Oh, here's Ben. Yeah. You guys went to Altoona. Yep, and Jared. And Jared, yep. yeah. yeah. So, um, How's Walter? But, uh, Walter seems to be, which is what I think we were hoping to see, very immersed in his studies. And uh, anyway, so that's good. Thank you for asking. Did you straighten it out with that professor? I think so. I think there was some kind of reasonable resolution to that. I, I don't know the details. Um, okay, so we're ready to begin. So let's uh, begin, please, by we're going to be singing number 318, Be Thou My Vision. Uh, I'll be singing this song, and then we'll be... Uh, have our Bible study with Carl, and Carl usually has, I think, an opening prayer, so you can take it from there. Number 318, Be Thou My Vision. Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that Thou beautiful lead-in uh, to our study tonight. It's a gorgeous song and, of course, the things we're encouraging each other to think about with our Lord, uh, just a, a beautiful uh, reminder for us. We are going to begin in just a moment. I don't know why I opened Deuteronomy. We're going to be in Acts chapter 17, finishing up there and beginning in Acts 18 tonight, God willing. Just a few moments. We are going to begin with a word of prayer. As I mentioned before, Jared uh, texted just before saying he's been sick all day uh, trying to get better and hasn't gotten any better. I'm not sure exactly what's going on with him, but he says keep him in prayer uh, and that he wouldn't be here tonight. But uh, we'll uh, be remembering others as well. There are some who are chronically uh, unable to be with us. We're prayerful for uh, Michelle, hopeful and prayerful that she'll be joining us online as well. And for uh, Judy, especially with her reaction she's had, this uh, allergic reaction, she's taking steroids to try to bring that swelling down. Uh, and for Andy as well. And uh, certainly for Art and Shirley, we uh, express Mike's sentiment from Sunday that we miss seeing them here. I uh, know uh, that they are uh, 
uh, always uh, wanting to be a part of things here and there, listening in. We're thankful for that, and we're encouraged by that. We'd love to see them again if God can make that happen. Uh, but we, we understand the situation there, and we keep praying for them. Let's join together in prayer now before we get into our text this evening. Our gracious Lord, we are so thankful for the goodness and the grace that you pour so richly on us. We pray you'll help us to recognize you as God and be thankful, to glorify you for all the good that you do. So many uh, yesterday were uh, looking up to the heavens, Father, to see uh, the eclipse. We're thankful for that great display of your power and the order that's behind that. It is true that uh, astronomers can predict eclipses down to the minute for centuries ahead of time and can go back and determine exactly when eclipses happened in the past because of the great and perfect order that you have established, Father. We know that even in this universe there is decay and there is uh, suffering and sadness that is now part of this broken world, and yet we still see glimpses of your perfection and, and things that are so well ordered even as we are suffering here. It grants us hope, Father, as we look at these things, we recognize that you are a God who does not change, that your plans for us are plans for goodness and not for disaster, and yet as we turn from you, as we turn our backs on you, disaster is the only thing that we can reap. We pray you'll help us, Father, to be turned to you always. Prayerful for all those who were looking to the heavens yesterday that some of them began to glorify you as creator and to look for you more deeply. That is our desire tonight, that we look more deeply into the scriptures, that we see you and we see your plan for us. We pray you'll guide us as we're studying together in Acts tonight. May we uh, try more and more uh, to imitate uh, the early uh, church, to do as they did because we see that you bless them as they were obedient to you. Because really what we desire is for all of us to be glorifying your Son and to be transformed more and more into His image as we learn from Him how to behave, how to do your will, and how to glorify and honor you with our lives. That is our prayer tonight. We pray you'll be with us, with all who are listening in, that you help us to do uh, exactly your will for your glory. These things we thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. I might mention also Iris. Uh, she's not here. She's got a lot of problems in her back right now. She says it's just really hard her to sit on these, these hard benches here. Uh, we may be working on something that'll help her getting a more comfortable chair and her to be able to sit in here for a little bit longer period of time. But I know she's listening in. She, she always comments on the studies and uh, they're really encouraging to her. And we're encouraged to know that she's with us. So we definitely want to remember her in your prayers as well. Acts 17, so we are in Athens. Paul has gone down to the Areopagus to talk with the great philosophers we were told in verse 21 that all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. This is some great new thing that Paul's got. He knows how great it is. They don't yet, but they're hearing him say some things that are kind of strange. He's talking about this, these strange gods, these, this, this Jesus and this resurrection. And so what is all of this that he's talking about? So he begins to lay it out before them. And we saw last week that he started by talking really an encouragement to them. It sounds almost uh, ironic when he says you're very religious. I don't think he meant that in a, in a negative way. He's using the term as they would have used it, so he's sort of encouraging them. You're, you're looking for the things of the gods. That is an encouraging thing. Uh, but you've got this God you don't know about. You've even put up a, a statue to him. But since you don't know him, let me, let me describe him to you. And that's where Paul goes. He takes advantage of where they are and then tries to bring them in using some of the things that were positive about what they were doing and bring them in to uh, a writer understanding of, of the God who is above all. And as he gets down through his argument about the one who has made all things and gives to all life, breath, and all things, he says they've even perceived this themselves, that some of their own prophets have said these things, if you will. Uh, they, have, they, they have mentioned that we are the offspring of God. He called them poets there, the idea is their spokesman. Uh, verse 28, we are also his offspring. And if that's the case, if you, if you honestly believe that, that we are made by the gods, then why would you think that these things you have made, gold or silver or stone or wood, are gods? They clearly are not. So whatever this idol is, it's at least representing something that's greater. And that something greater has not got the same nature as even the temples that you've made or all these great structures, all these great idols. And so let's think about the one who made all of this. I think that's a great uh, explanation as you begin to look at sort of naturalistic religions, those who 
uh, maybe worshiping trees or worshiping Mother Earth or worshiping the sun. Uh, these days you may have had some doing that, even worshiping the moon perhaps, who blocked the sun. And yet, there's one who made all of those. And that is what all of those parts of creation are screaming out. Uh, Psalm 19 the heavens declare the glory of God. That's what David says there. This is not a new concept that Paul is using. He's right in line with Moses, who began the very Bible, revealed by God, of course, with Genesis 1, the creation account. God is creator. And that's where Paul takes these pagans. When he's talking to the Jews, you notice up through, uh, up until chapter 17, he's begun by going into the synagogue. But here in Athens, he didn't do that. He went to the place where their philosophers are meeting, where their religious men were. But when he begins with the Jews, he begins with the story of the family, of the Jewish family that already belongs to God. They know who God the Creator is. They don't need that introduction, but these pagans do. And so he starts with God the Creator. And he says, if you truly believe the Creator, some, the gods, made you as their offspring, then why would you think the gods are these false things? But he goes further. He says in verse 30, these times of ignorance God overlooked but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. They had asked, what is this you're talking about, someone resurrected from the dead? Well, here's the answer. There is a man, there is a direct offspring, if you will, of the gods or of God in this case, the God who among the Jews had established this tenet, this Old Testament, had set up knowledge for them, is willing to overlook the lack of knowledge among the Gentiles. That's what Paul's saying here. It's not that God is completely throwing that out. We saw in the time of Nineveh that the Gentiles were supposed to be serving God and they weren't. They repented when uh, Jonah preached to them. They repented uh, at the, the preaching from God. And so there was some sort of thing they were, they were being held to by God and they understood what it was. But he's talking about here, this period that's gone by, God is now giving them an opportunity for repentance. He's commanding all men everywhere to repent. He's made them all, every nation of men from one blood. So they're all his. And so he has rights to them all. And he says you must repent. And the reason for that, why does he say they must repent? What's coming? a judgment day, an appointed day of judgment. Some scholars will say, well, Paul thought that day was coming very soon, and so he was getting people ready. It is coming very soon, any day. <laughs> but it's been 2,000 years since Paul said this, and it may be 2,000 more, but it's still any day. <laughs> We're supposed to be prepared for the judgment at any time, and it may come tonight for us. <laughs> now, the day of judgment won't be the official day of judgment until it comes, but for us, whenever this life ends. We're going to be sitting before the throne of God until the judgment comes, but there's no time passage for those who are not in a physical body. So we can talk about that in some other study, but the point is there's a day that this is all leading to. The one who made this world, this whole creation, made it with a purpose, and there's going to be a day in which he's going to judge how that purpose has been fulfilled by those who are living for his purposes. Whether you recognize you're living for his purposes or not, you are. <laughs> you are living for his purposes. Purposes. And so the sooner you figure out what those are and how to fulfill those, the sooner you can be pleasing to him. And that's the message he's bringing before these, these philosophers. They're seeking to do what is right in their own eyes. They're seeking this philosophy and they have these great schools of thought because they're looking for truth. They're looking for doing what is right. So this is something that he's also commending, but he's saying there's a purpose to all of this. It's headed somewhere. Don't just get it right eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we'll die. Get it right so this life you'll have some kind of pleasure. Get it right because there is something greater. The one who is greater has something greater planned, and this day of judgment is coming. And he's proved that he's capable of judging by a really fascinating way in verse 31. What has he done to prove both judgment and really salvation is the point. When you're looking at judgment, what you want is salvation. You want to be saved from judgment. And he brings both of those into this verse. What has he done to prove that? Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's raised a man from the dead who's going to be the judge. If this man has the power to escape death, he's the one you want teaching you how to escape death, right? That's, that's the point. 
This word judge is the same concept that was used for the judges in the Old Testament. Some of your other translations may have the word Savior. God raised up for them a Savior. That's what these judges were. They were judging what Israel had been doing so they could bring them out of it and bring them to salvation. That was the point. So when Jesus said, as we looked at on Sunday, I came not to judge the world, I appreciate Ben bringing that up, that, that idea, he didn't come into the world to judge the world. Now, will his coming into the world judge it? Absolutely. But that's not the purpose. He came to save. So he didn't come to pronounce the sentence. He came to say, there is a sentence. Here's how you get it commuted. Here's how you get saved from it. So the same author, John, later in 1 John will say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's done that through our advocate, through Christ. That's, that's John's language in 1 John. But here, speaking to these pagans, Paul is laying this idea out sort of for a first time. Now, this is a, this is a, a, a legalistic society, if you will, in the sense that they understand how, uh, how jurisprudence works. A lot of our court models are based on these Greek and Roman models of the court system. They certainly understand the concept of justice and judgment. Romans chapter 2, Paul says even the Gentiles, they can approve or disapprove of the things they're doing or the things other people are doing usually would be the case if you're disapproving because they have a conscience and they can judge based on conscience. That is an unwritten but really strong argument for the existence of an intelligent creator, a creator who has given us a conscience and a capacity for judging what's morally good and what's morally wrong. When people say, don't do that, it's wrong, who are they to judge? That's what someone will say. But there are things that all of us can agree on that are wrong. <laughs> and if there was no, no overarching morality, there was no higher intelligence, how would we have a standard for that? We wouldn't be able to judge. But here's a man, Paul says, who God has set up to be the, the judge, and he's ordained and proven it by raising him from the dead. You want to know about the resurrection? That's why I got to the one who was resurrected is the one who God has set up to be his judge. That is really what the Messiah was. He's the biggest of the judges. <laughs> He's the biggest of the prophets. He's the biggest of the priests. He's the biggest of the saviors. There is no other name given under heaven by which men may be saved. That's the concept. And so Paul has put that into Gentile language now for them. So verse 32, they heard of the resurrection of the dead and some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. There's a judgment coming. There's a one who has overcome death, and he's the one who's going to pronounce the judgment. So you might be intrigued to think, okay, how did he do it? Uh, that was what intrigued me. Uh, I think I've told this part of the story before, but when I was first converted, my friends all wanted to accuse me. Why did you choose Christianity? I said, he's the only one who is still alive. <laughs> all the other great leaders of these religions have all died, and they're still in their tombs. He is not. and He's the one I'm going to follow because that's the promise he's making to me. He's the first fruits. He's going to bring others with him. So that's what Paul is saying, and some were intrigued and said, yes, let's hear some more, while others mocked, and that's always going to be the case. You get two sides on these arguments. So Paul departed, and some went with him. Uh, some men joined him and believed. Believed is a catchword for they did the things that he was teaching. They, they followed. Among them, Dionysius the Areopagite, that phrase means that he is one of the judges, <laughs> of the Areopagus. He's one of the men who serves as a judge. He has now been introduced to the judge. He's a man who understands this concept very well. Um, a woman named Damaris and others with them. I like again that they're mentioning the women who are involved here. This is a, this is a big deal and this word is overarching. It's for all. Just an interesting uh, side note here. Does anybody know what the name Dionysius means? This person that's converted here has a very interesting Greek name. About drinking? Yeah. <laughs> Greek with you. Yeah, yeah, it's the, the god of like Bacchus. Yeah, literally Dionysus means devoted to Bacchus. <laughs> so this is, this is a guy whose name means I'm devoted to debauchery, to, to drunkenness. And yet he's believed the truth and he's become converted. It's interesting, he doesn't change his name. Maybe he does later. Maybe we know him as a different name and never told what it is. But, you know, so many of the Christians in the first century, they, they have a name change after their conversion. But I sort of like the fact that his name would have been something so negative, and yet he has now found life. <laughs> he is, he's, been, he's been through the judgment and come out on the other side. His name doesn't mean he's got to always be, uh, doesn't have to live down to his name, let's put it that way. Uh, so comments or questions about this 
approach that Paul used here with these pagans, how it's a little different than what they, uh, they did among the Jews. Yeah, David? Uh, something he does here is he, he preemptively heads off a misunderstanding they could have. So he quotes from this poem, For We Are Indeed His Offspring. And in that uh, poem, which you can just Google um, by a dude named Aratus, mm -hmm. it's in the middle of this paragraph about you know, Zeus and all this stuff, about how Zeus shows them that they, he is powerful by the signs he gives them, by the stars and the sun and the moon and the seasons. And so he's pre the way I read it, he's emphasizing that the sign is now Jesus. Mm -hmm. So there's no, if they're like, oh, well, this day of judgment's coming, well, we can look to the sun and the stars, right? They didn't have to do that so much with the Jewish people. They were not tempted to be astrologists in that regard, right? They had their understanding of the scripture and knew that signs came from God, not from all this right. other stuff, um, or not in every case anyway. But here, in this midst of all this paganness, right, they could be tempted to go, oh, judgment's coming, well, let's look to the, all the things we usually do. Uh, but he makes it very clear that in direct contrast to the poem he's quoting from, which they would be familiar with, mm -hmm. it's not about signs from the stars and the heavens and everything. The sign is now Jesus. Yeah, he so, is the sign, yeah. Yeah. That's a great poem. It's not a great poem <laughs> translated, by the way. It's, it didn't read great, but it's worth yeah. checking out. Yeah, interesting. I, I like that Paul is starting where they are, though. So you saw Philip did that with the eunuch, the eunuchs in Isaiah. So he uses Isaiah. These are philosophers that are going to know Greek texts, and so he starts with one of their poets, one of their prophets. Uh, Isaiah, that was poetry, by the way, Isaiah 53, that the, that eunuch was reading. So Paul is, is well-versed, and he's able to use that but he's not substituting man's writings for God's writing. He's bringing them to God, but he's saying the ideas that you have even in your own writings point to the fact that there's something beyond what you're believing in. Look beyond. I, I saw Don and then Mike. I just, there's another passage where Paul says, I became all things to all people. Mm -hmm. And that's just is another example of how Paul can tailor his conversation to the different groups. Yeah, it's helpful for us to, to have a sort of a broad-based understanding of some things. We want to make sure that we don't make caricatures of what other people believe, and Paul's not doing that here, but it's easy to do that. People do that with us. We don't like it, but then we go and try to do it with them. Let's make sure we understand what we're dealing with, but if we have opportunities, we should try to meet people where they are. I appreciate Rick is, is having opportunities to do that. He's been reading through the Koran to kind of help with a friend of his who's, who's sort of looking beyond the Koran now because he can show her things in the Koran that point outside the Koran, the things that are greater than that. What a great opportunity, and I think many of us may have stories similar to that. Mike, did you have a comment? Yeah, well, mm. To piggyback on what Dave was saying, the astrologers saw the star when Jesus was born, yeah. and they followed, and they somewhere along the way, they were astrologists, and they back. I guess you go back into, I guess Daniel. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah they, and they, they had they, some hints that they had hints. They must have been something was said about this. And these guys were stargazers. Yeah. And it's funny that they noticed the star. And it's probably something they heard for years. Yeah, they were descendants of the Chaldeans. That's who, that's who yeah. took Israel into captivity. And so, yeah, it's really amazing to think about that God planted that seed so long ago that they would come and then this great event uh, that they would know about. So God always had intended to bring in the pagans. <laughs> and there's just so many uh, uh, great little foreshadowing of that all through, through Bible history. Uh, but yeah, Paul's able to use that and he can, he can weave these things together. We'll do as best we can. We want to be grounded firmly in teaching people the scripture clearly, but if they bring other things along, let's not necessarily just throw those things out. Let's find some common ground and work from it to point beyond what they've got. You notice what Paul did. He says, look, you're talking about things that are actually right. You're talking about them in wrong ways, maybe. You're talking about things that are actually right, though. Let's go see how that's right. Uh, I think that's an important thing that he did here. Uh, I, one other thing. We oh, Go ahead, Jerome. Yeah, and it takes me back to um, even though everyone may not be on the same page at the same moment, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has placed eternity into the heart of men. And so in other words, it's there. All men have this innately put in them by God. It's just that some people exercise what God has given them um, from birth. It's, it's in us. It's, it's a part of us. Yeah, I appreciate that. It actually leads me to the point I was getting ready to make. So thank you for that. Uh, one of the things that I, I was going to make sure we got back to mention, we were, I was saying you're made for his purposes. He is, the creator has made us all for his purposes. The reason I say that is that's what Paul says, verses 26 and 27. God made us all from one blood to dwell all, all over the face of the earth. Remember, that's be fruitful, multiply. That's from Genesis. He's, he wanted you to spread and fill the entire earth. 
and he pre-appointed their times and boundaries of their dwellings. God put people where they are, when they are, for an express purpose, so that they should seek the Lord. And that's the Ecclesiastes 3.11 moment. God has said it so that as we look up, we're longing for something eternal. As we recognize our own mortality, we're thinking there's got to be something more. That is one of the great moral arguments also against atheism. The atheist also recognizes that their child has more weight than their 15 dogs. They won't say that at first. They'll say life is life, but who are they going to protect if it comes down to it? They're not going to go huddle around their dogs and let their child get shot. They're going to grab their child while somebody's shooting at their dogs every time because they recognize that human life has an intrinsic value that goes beyond just this moment. It's the great human condition. Why do we have the ability to think and reason and feel if all we are is dust? Why? <laughs> There's a good reason for it. And the more you think through that, the closer you get to finding the answer. Maybe you don't want it, <laughs> that there is a creator that's given us that, and he's calling us to himself. It's a beautiful thing, and Paul's using that here as he's talking to them. So don't think we're like wood or stone or these, these things. We're like the one who made us to think. That's why you guys can think this way. That's a great argument he uses here. But it's time for him to depart. You remember he was waiting for Timothy and Silas to come to him. They did not show up while he's here. Uh, perhaps he's a bit worried about them, but he also has more work to do. He's going off from Athens, from the, the frying pan to the fire, you might say. He's heading over to Corinth. Corinth is a major city. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about this, but it's an important trade city. It's on uh, this canal now, but at the time it was on a short space of land between two ports where they would literally drag the goods across land. Well, it took a couple of days to do that, and so it was a great port city where all people from all over the world would sort of convene. It had gotten a great uh, fame as being a city of, city of great luxury and great riches so that many Roman soldiers, when they got their retirement, would retire to Corinth. That's where you want to be. That's where you want to go hang out for the rest of your retirement. That's where all the fun is. All of that. And so that's where Paul is headed. Uh, you know, think New Orleans, think Las Vegas, think those kind of things. That is part of the Corinthian atmosphere. All the different gods and all the different pleasures you can imagine, and it's all right there for you. That's where Paul's headed. We might think he'd want to go to some little country town where people are going to be more conservative and have a better time preaching. That's not where he goes. And we can see perhaps why he gets shaken a bit early on and God stands beside him and says, nope, you need to be right here. This is where you need to be. I don't know how many preachers there are in New Orleans or Las Vegas or these places that just have this seedy reputation, but I'm hopeful it's a lot. <laughs> I'm hopeful there are men who have, have readied themselves and put themselves in that situation to reach the lost people in those towns that need it just as much as lost people anywhere else do. Uh, but that's where Paul was headed when we get to Acts chapter 18. So let's read through the first few verses here. I think we'll read down through verse, um, let's we'll start verse just one through three to get it set up here. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. There's a, a good bit just in these few verses here. So I don't know, I, I'll intend to have a map up next week. I apologize for the last couple weeks not having many of the visuals. It has been part of my uh, uh, taking a rest. The things that I spend a lot of time on usually are these slides, and I've just needed to take a rest. And so I think I'll be uh, able to get back to it in the, ne the next couple of weeks. But I want to have some maps up so we can see these things better. But if you've got a map of the journeys in, your, in the back of your Bible, I, I would encourage you to look there. You'll see where Athens is down at the foot of this sort of uh, long stretch of land at the bottom of Achaia, and right across from it is Corinth. So it's not a very long journey. It was a long way down from Berea when he went down through there, uh, but now it's not a very long journey over to Corinth. So he heads back over there now, and uh, when he gets there, he runs into a Jew and his wife, Aquila and Priscilla. They are from Pontus, so let's go, I meant to do that while we were still looking there. Um, they are from Pontus, which is the very north up by the Black Sea, if you'll look at what is today's Turkey. If you can find Antioch uh, there of, of uh, Pisidia, 
and go north, due north, you're going to run into Pontus up there. Uh, so sort of countrymen of, of Paul, but not really. They're all just uh, Turkish or that uh, Asia Minor area. But that's where these, are, these Jews are from. So they're Hellenistic Jews, but they had been in Rome and have been, or had been in Italy at least, and have been expelled from there, uh, possibly Rome, because Claudius had commanded the Jews to depart from Rome. Rome might be the whole, whole of Italy, but uh, possibly just the city. But that's helpful to us because it gives us a date. We know when Claudius made this decree. That was in 49. Remember that the, the circumcision discussion in Jerusalem was in 49 or 50. I think it was late 49. Uh, uh, that's my understanding of it at least. And so Paul's been journeying over to here. So they're getting there roughly at the same time. And so he's found fellow Jews, and not only that, fellow tent makers. So he's got people that he's got a lot in common with, and so he, he quickly uh, sort of comes to them. Don't know if he ends up staying with them. We find out in the book of Romans that they do house brethren in their home, and so it's possible that they were well enough off and they were allowing Paul to stay with them. I'm not sure what that phrase, he came to them, means more than that. But he was of the same trade, and so he stayed with them and worked for by occupation. They were tent makers. So why is he making tents here? Paul and Silas, uh, or, uh, Timothy and Silas have not come yet. We're going to find out later that when they do come, he gets right to work. He stops making tents. He gets to work doing the other stuff. But while he's making tents, he doesn't stop preaching and teaching here. But he's got an opportunity here to sort of support himself and those who are with him. He'll mention that later. Uh, and he's got uh, Priscilla and Aquila, or Aquila, with him now. So let's go on uh, down uh, verses 4 through 17 now and watch what happens early on in Corinth. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, Look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. And all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But God took no notice of these things. All right, that's a lot going on here. He found the synagogue. This is a major city, and there are, there's a synagogue at least there. He goes and reasons every Sabbath and began persuading both Jews and Greeks. He's persuading. That's what he's doing. He's using arguments that, that line up uh, a defense of this a message that he's teaching. And so he's persuading. Sometimes people will say when I, when I begin to study the Bible with them, well, you can't make me believe anything. You can't make me believe what you believe. I said, I'm not planning to. It's not, my, it's not my job to make you believe it, but I have to present it for you. And I have to persuade you why I believe it. That's part of my job. And I can't make you believe it, but I can give you all the arguments that, that helped me to believe. And you're going to have to make the decision on your own. We're not trying to force people to believe what we believe. We're trying to present the truth to people, and they're going to have to make a decision. God has appointed a day of judgment. People that judge themselves unworthy of eternal life reject the truth. Paul said that as much already when he was teaching in the synagogue earlier. So he makes this reasoned approach from the, from the Scriptures and persuades both Jews and Greeks. And while he's doing that, verse 5, finally... Silas and Timothy come from Macedonia. We find out later in, in one of Paul's letters to the Corinthians that they actually came with support. <laughs> they were possibly bringing support from the Thessalonians already. Uh, Paul had said that the, the Thessalonians and the Philippians had helped them already from early on uh, in, his, uh, in his work, the Philippians, from the very first. Uh, but uh, Paul perhaps had received that support from them, but at any rate, he's now able to do the work full-time. 
compelled by the Spirit, begins to testify to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. So you've got Jews and Greeks who are persuaded, but when you see the second use of the Jews here, these are the ones that are still Jews. They haven't become Christians. They weren't persuaded. So he's showing them, look, this says that Jesus is the Christ. This is what uh, the, the Scriptures were pointing to. So they opposed him and blasphemed. Think about that for just a moment. How would they be blaspheming? What does it mean to blaspheme? We used that word very early on. What is it? You know, even the works of Jesus, we just use for blasphemy saying it was the devil. Yeah. He worked for the devil, not from God. So they were rejecting that Jesus was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. That's blasphemy, right? You can blaspheme against God. If they're saying, you're lying and this man is not the Son of God, then really that's blasphemy if he is the Son of God. They're calling Jesus a liar. So I believe that's what's going on here. They're rejecting the Christ. That's not just something as simple as saying, well, I choose to believe in another Christ. That is blasphemy. <laughs> and the, the Jews need to know that. And as Luke is writing this, there are Jews still reading this. They need to understand that what they've done is blasphemy. They've rejected God and, and, and mis, uh, misspoken about the Son of God. So they oppose and blaspheme. And so Paul shook his garments. And you might think, because this is what Jesus told the other apostles to do, he's ready to leave town. In fact, I think God's what stops him from leaving town here. God's the one who, who intervenes here. He shakes his, his garments and says, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clean. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. He does go next door and begin to teach, but God's then going to tell him, I need you to stick around a little while, Paul. This is not shaking the dust off time yet. <laughs> he does that to the Jews. Now, it's interesting to me that Jesus had told the apostles to do that. And it almost sounds like something he just made up on the spot. Clearly it's not. The Jews here understood what Paul was doing <laughs> as he's shaking off the dust. This is some sort of a Jewish expression that Jesus was having the apostles use. The Jews understood that what he's doing is saying, this is on you. From now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. So he goes how far? I love this detail. Look at verse 7. How far does he go to start teaching? the house next door. And he takes one of the guys from the, uh, from the synagogue with him. It looks like just as one who worshiped God. This is one man who had already been converted, perhaps from those that were learning at the synagogue there. Justice is a Roman name, so possibly was among the Gentiles that converted. But Justice is like, well, the Jews don't want you over there. Come over here. And so he goes and begins teaching at Justice's house. And can you imagine how this is like a thumb to the nose to these Jews? That is not Paul's intent, but He's got an opportunity, and here are people coming to the synagogue that want to hear, and the Jews are trying to pull them away. Paul's going to be as close as he can to say, come listen to this instead. <laughs> and that's where he is, standing next to the synagogue uh, in this man named Justice's home. And look at verse 8. It gets worse for the Jews in the synagogue. Who's the first one we're told about believing here? Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue. In 1 Corinthians, when Paul's saying, I didn't baptize very many of you, he says, but I did baptize Crispus. <laughs> That's one that he remembers. And Gaius is another one he puts on there. But I'm glad I didn't baptize a whole lot of you. But Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue. So this is pretty convincing. So you don't become the ruler of the synagogue just because you know, it happens to be your turn. This is somebody they respected. And here he is now, uh, believing on the Lord with all his household. Again, we see that phrase and then we get a description, and I really love this, verse 8. Sometimes we're just told they believed on the Lord. But sometimes we're shown what that looks like. So what do we know about the Corinthians? And I love this when you read the Corinthian letter later. The way that Paul just sort of has this as, this is taken for granted. What do we know about them when they believed? What are, what are we told in verse 8? They heard, they believed, and they were baptized. <laughs> We see those things together a lot. Sometimes we see them individually, but I think it's fascinating when we get them completely together in the same phrase as believed on the Lord with his household, then in the same verse at least, then you get, and many also of the Corinthians did the same thing. They heard, believed, and were baptized. Yes, Mike. Um, that phrase back in verse 6, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. What does that actually convey? <laughs> is it, you know, maybe one fraction exasperation, or is it, you know, fully inspired? I'm not going to waste time anymore with bringing the word to Jews unless they're already converted, or 
Yeah, I don't think he means exactly that. Back in Acts uh, 14, he said the same thing, okay. uh, or Acts 13 maybe, okay. to the Jews there. The point is, I'm done wasting my time on you, Jews. I'm going to go take this to the Gentiles. They didn't like it there, and they're certainly not going to like it here. But he is, he's moving, he's shifting gears. If the Jews don't want to hear it, the Gentiles will. Romans talks about that. Now, I think God's plan was to bring to jealousy the Jews when they saw the Gentiles coming in. And so that's, that was really part of God's plan. That's, that's a great question, but I think it is more local than, than universal still at this point. Um, so, um, so Crispus has now believed. They're in the house of justice next door to the synagogue, and now the leader of the synagogue. Yes, Linda. Okay, well, um, justice, the worship of, worshiper of God. Do we know, does that tell us he's a Gentile that worships God or a Jew? So the, the fact that it's worshiper of God and not faithful Jew or just Jew okay. indicates, plus his name is Roman, so that indicates more clearly also. Mm -hmm. Aquila is also is, however, that means eagle. Uh, Del Aquila <laughs> should know that one. Uh, it's the same, same word. But, uh, so, but in this case, I think the point is, he is he's a Gentile. It may not be, but usually when, it's, when it spells out a believer of God or a fearer of God or a worshiper of God, it's, it's distinguishing him from the Jews who just by nature almost would be. Yeah. So uh, that's a great question. I don't know that I've answered it fully, but I think it leans more to the idea that he was, a, he was a Gentile. So they're at his house. The ruler of the synagogue has now believed, but you can imagine how daunting this is going to be for Paul. Those Jews are not going to be taking this lightly. He's already got all the Thessalonian Jews mad at him. <laughs> They've been chasing him from city to city. Timothy and Silas finally catch up to him and start giving him some support. And now he's made this synagogue mad. And so he's shaking the dust off. But the Lord speaks to him in the night by a vision. And the Lord has come to comfort him. And this is going to be a very uh, unusual theme in the life of Paul. We're going to see this several times just in the book of Acts. But by night, the Lord comes and says, do not be afraid. Speak and do not keep silent. It's kind of interesting that what the Lord tells him to do is the same thing they prayed for back in chapter 4. They wanted not to be afraid. They wanted God to look on the threats and grant them that they would be able to speak without fear. And that's what Jesus comes and says. I wonder if Paul hasn't been praying the same thing. And Jesus has come in response. I am with you. No one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. That's what I was talking about before. <laughs> I wonder how many people are in... Las Vegas and in New Orleans and in these sin cities, if you want to call them that, preaching the word of God because God has many people in those cities still. There are innocents being born every day into those cities. Uh, Acts 17 uh, was one of the texts that helped me when I was a brand new Christian and a very, very intelligent older Christian was really struggling with his faith as he was looking into inner city Los Angeles where you have children being born into gang houses by the time they're eight, they're trigger men for the gangs. And he says, how is their God there? How is God even there? How is it even possible? <laughs> but Acts 17, the, the text that helped me is, they were born there in that place and at that time so that they should seek the Lord. They are seeing death and all kinds of other horrible things on a daily basis. Surely somewhere in there they're thinking, this can't be all there is. There's got to be something better. There's got to be something good somewhere. And it's amazing, many of them do think that and try to find ways to get out. It's not that they're just locked into that. They don't have to live that way. It's unfortunate many of them choose to. But that's the case anywhere. Why do we only see it in the worst possible places? There are horrible family situations right here where we are. Some of us have come out of them, and we've been seeking for the Lord, and that's why. And so we need to remember that God has made a promise. The one who asks, it'll be open to him. The one who seeks will find. Uh, and... Uh, the one who asks, it'll be given. The one who knocks, it'll be open. And the one who seeks, will find. That's a promise. The eunuch discovered that in the middle of the desert. And there are people in inner cities that are discovering that as the word gets to them as well. Paul's in Corinth for that very reason. And that's what Jesus is reminding him here. I have many people in this city. I guarantee you the Lord has many people in Pittsburgh. What are we doing to get out and find them? What are we doing to get out and get the word to them so they can come to know him and serve him? We need to be diligent about this like Paul is. So, because of that, he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. You'd think, being next door to the synagogue, he's going to have trouble. But he's there a year and six months. He'll say something very similar later on to the Ephesian elders, that he spent so much time there in the middle of all kinds of tribulation, 
but he did not stop preaching to them day and night the, the truth, the whole counsel of God, and that's what he's doing here. So he spent a year and six months among them. Then we're told in verse 12, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. Again, we got dates for this. We know when he was there. Uh, for a long time, there was a lot of doubt about whether Gallio was actually a proconsul, whether or not proconsul is even the right term. And recently, uh, recently in archaeological terms, it's been a decade or so now, they have found a, an inscription in Corinth near the Bema that says Gallio the proconsul and has the very dates that we already suspected, uh, somewhere 50, 51, 52 AD when this is happening. I've got July 51 through 52 AD because we know when he was appointed. Uh, but when this happened, we're not sure. But it was in 51 or 52. That puts us at the time that Paul's there. The Jews came out of Rome in 49. So it gives us a really hard sort of date to work from when Paul is in Corinth. So we can gauge where some of the letters would have been written uh, after this as well. Yes, Dave? I did not read ahead. Do you have more background on why Claudius was kicking folks out of Rome? <sighs> a tiny bit. Uh, from, I think, Eusebius, who wrote later, uh, said that Claudius was concerned about a group of people that were causing insurrections in the name of one Crestus, which seems to be a misspelling of Christ. Um, that would have been an early persecution of Christians if that is the case. Um, the only, that's the only sort of historical information that I know of that we have, and it's written by one of the church fathers a little bit later in the, in the first century. So uh, other than that, I don't. But it'd be great research if someone wants to do that. Yeah, Mike? Sorry, when you say church father, you were... I'm using that in a very generic way. Yeah. yeah. Not that I would consider them, but uh, early disciples of the apostles. That's in the... Faith of our father, Tim. Exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, that's just a generic term for some of the first level disciples after the apostles. It does not mean that I'm following what they taught because some of them actually fell away pretty quickly from teaching the truth of Scripture, unfortunately. So... That's, that's what we know roughly in there. There's a lot, that's, that's a pretty easy one you can Google. There's a lot of information about that. I just didn't do a whole lot of uh, research on it uh, before this class today. Uh, but we know when he was there, that gives us a hard and fast date that's helpful. So Gallio, when he comes in, this is probably fairly early in his term. So maybe we're talking about by the end of 51 when this event happens because the Jews see an opportunity. We've got a new proconsul. We've got one who doesn't know the stuff we've been doing against this guy, so he might be on our side. We'll take him up and make some bad claims about him, so they do. They rise up against him and bring him to the judgment seat. They've got all these witnesses, right, so they can bring him before the judgment seat. And they say, this guy wants us to worship God contrary to the law. <clears throat> well, that's going to make proconsul's ears prick up. What are they going to do that's so heinous? <laughs> How are they breaking Roman law? That's not what the Jews mean, but they're trying to couch it that way, just like they tried to get Jesus convicted and did as being another king. So uh, they're, this fellow's persuading men to worship God contrary to the law. And Paul's about to tell them about it, and the Jews already get their response. God is like, wait a second. You're talking about your law. You're talking about your stuff. I'm not here for that. You guys see to it yourselves. You go figure that out. But I love something he sticks in here. If there were real wrongdoing, if there were real wicked crimes, if there was something I really needed to know about, I would listen to you. I'm not worried about that kind of stuff. But if it's a question of words and names in your own law, names? Very clearly, they're upset that he's teaching that Jesus is the Christ. And they're bringing this man's name. And that, they're probably already saying, he's teaching that Jesus is another king. And God was like, yeah, right. <laughs> Somebody... Go overthrow Caesar's throne. Yeah, right. Okay. Somebody from among you got, yeah. Okay. Uh, you go take care of that. <laughs> and that's just pretty easy to put that down. And so he does. I don't even care about that. I'm not even going to listen to it. You guys go look to it yourselves. I'm not here to be a judge of such matters. They don't even say that. It's worse. I don't want to be a judge of such matters. Even if he's there to keep things from rising up to insurrection level, this clearly is not going to do that. <laughs> if it would have, why didn't it yet? <laughs> you know, why hasn't it been a problem up to now? Why'd you, now you bring him to me? You know, where's, what the other proconsul do about this? I'm sure he's going to look at the records. This isn't something new. They're, they're harping up these things against him. So you handle that. And he drove them from the judgment seat. This is not like sort of just get out of here. He's had them carried off. <laughs> well, they're so upset about that that it says the Greeks in my verse. Anybody have a different reading there in verse 17? 
The Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him. They all. all. There's some doubt about exactly who's involved in this, whether this is the synagogue people that are beating him, whether this is something when he's driving them out, all of the townspeople are like, you guys are always causing problems, and they go and beat him. But they beat Sosthenes. Who is Sosthenes? I thought Crispus was the ruler of the synagogue. (laughs) Clearly not, since he converted, right? So now you've got the second, this new ruler of the synagogue, and he's just gotten beaten by all of the Greeks or all of the townspeople or maybe by the synagogue people themselves. Again, it's pretty ambiguous. And they do that right in front of of Gallio. He's like, I didn't see anything. (laughs) You guys deserve this, sort of. Took no notice of these things. Go read 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1, somebody. Whoever gets there, read that for me. There's a reason behind that. All the bond servant. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Romans. <laughs> it was close, though. It's going to be similar to that. <laughs> Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. So, as he's writing the letter to the Corinthians, we always remember Timothy and Silas and those guys. Sosthenes is with Paul writing this. It's a fairly common name. But why just throw that one in at the heading of the Corinthian letter unless it's this Sosthenes that they know? I'm betting this is Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, who is now also converted. (laughs) After the Jews didn't protect him, after he's heard these accusations and now has looked into them further, by the time Paul writes the letter to the Corinthians, you've got Sosthenes. Yes, it's a supposition, Mike. Go ahead. (laughs) Yes, it was written later, uh, I think four or five years later. Uh, I'll have the dates on that hopefully next week. That'll be part of the package I'm planning to put up here with the, with the dates and the, and the travels. But yes, a few years later, as he's concerned about what's going on with them. Yeah. Yeah, since we're at the letter, it's interesting to note, just that I quickly like, say, skin, the things that this church <laughs> has trouble with is the same behaviors, or many of the same behaviors at least, that we see the, the Jews just having, right? There's divisions, there's quarreling about names, I follow this name, I follow that name, so on and so forth. There's even a, a huge call out about revilers um, in the fifth chapter, and that's what they were doing, was reviling or blaspheming in your translation. Mm-hmm. So it's just interesting to show, you know, it's very hard to shake habits. The, the issues they are having are almost foreshadowed, foretold by the issues the Jews are giving Paul when he's there for the first time. And not only that, I appreciate that, but you see there's a division among the Jews and the Gentiles here already. There's this there's sort of division among the ranks in the synagogue with these Gentiles who early on believe and you're at the Gentiles' house next door, perhaps, if justice is. So in the, in the Corinthian letter, there's these problems rising also between Jewish and Gentile thinking. So you've got all of this microcosm. It didn't change just because they all became Christians. It's supposed to. That's what Paul's point is. You're supposed to be growing beyond this, but they need work. You know, uh, we're, we're all growing. We're all being perfected in holiness. And so that's going to take some time, some change and some growth. And so even with all their problems, a few years later when he writes, he calls them the church of God at Corinth. They haven't stopped being God's people. They need some work and they've got a lot of things to work through, but they're still God's people. And that's why they need to work on it. Yeah, Linda. Um, I mean, this is just my Bible, but... Um the reference for a soft yeah. Sosthenes, yeah. <laughs> um, in First Corinthians refers back to eighteen Acts eighteen seventeen. Yeah. I think it's it's very, very likely this is the same person. Uh, it, it just wouldn't be like Paul just to throw somebody's name in there randomly if they don't know who he is for sure. And probably in this case, if we don't know who he is, all the other ones we can trace who they're talking about. Even in Romans 16, there's a long laundry list of names there. Many of them we never see anywhere else, but Paul has reason to understand that the Romans know them, and they're people that he's looking forward to seeing that he's met in other parts of the world, Aquila and Priscilla among them in Romans 16 there. They met here in Corinth the first time. So I think this is just a, a, a beautiful picture of the work that he's doing here, the problems that arose, and yet God wants him to be there for this. But after this, he's going to still spend a little bit of time there, and he's going to head off back uh, toward Syria, which is Antioch, and head back toward where he was sent out and where they left from originally. Uh, We don't really have time to to get back into a whole lot here, but I want to read down through 23. This is just a travel section. Uh, So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. 
He had his hair cut off at Sancria, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he landed at Caesarea and had gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So that's really starting another uh, bit. So uh, down through 22 is the end of this second missionary uh, journey, if you will, this missionary, uh, these travels, these moves. But he spent a little while still at Corinth. We're not sure how long, but uh, you know, more than a year and six months, over two years total probably. Then he leaves and takes Priscilla and Aquila with him, going back to Syria. That's where Antioch of Syria is. We're told, though, he had his hair cut off at Sincrea, for he had taken a vow. I thought, I thought he was a Christian. Yeah, what does that mean? That's a good question. What does it mean? <laughs> yeah, Don? I guess you can't do a Nazarite vow, because then you, do your, you don't cut your hair. Yeah, then you leave your hair on. Yeah, this is part of some ritual from, from the vows among the Jews. He is still a cultural Jew. And he's going to argue strongly against the need for sacrifices and vows for salvation, but yet they're still a part of his culture that will allow him to do these kind of things. And so he's taking a vow here. He'll, he'll pay the price for a vow for some men when he gets to Jerusalem. That's actually going to end up being bad advice that he accepts, I believe. Uh, but he does that when he gets to Jerusalem, and that starts causing the problems that gets him arrested. But this is not Paul um, going back to keeping Jewish law. But if he's going to do the vows... He only has the guide of the Jewish law to do them, so he's going to follow what that says. Just a quick word on vows. that They are the thank offerings in Leviticus chapter 3. They are voluntary offerings. This is not something that God commanded that you would do. This is a votive or a vow offering. He's voluntarily doing this, and so this is not part of the, the salvation plan, if you will. He is not going back on what he teaches, that you don't have to be a Jew to be a, a servant of God. But that's an important question. Sometimes people will, will throw that at us. Yeah, Jerome? Do like when he took this vow, um, did that pertain to prayer or what? What would he have taken a vow for? Like I, what types of things did they? Take I wish they time? told us more about it. There's a there's a little bit of uh, Talmudic history outside of the Bible. We don't really see a lot in the Bible. We're told they could do it, could vow things to the Lord, uh, but I'm not sure what kind of vow this would have been. Just at the end of your vow, you take a peace offering uh, to pay it off. So he cut his hair off so that when it grew out, he would then go and give a peace offering and maybe shave it off again to say that the vow had ended. Uh, but those were all just sort of outward symbols. Those are not even guided by uh, Levitical law at all. These are, these are things that are sort of outside. The vow itself is guided by Levitical law, so he does it according to that. But the other rites were just, they were Talmudic. They were just interpretational things. So he's still culturally following some Jewish practices. But for salvation, the, the law has ended. At Christ. Now, he writes that very clearly in Romans chapter 10. Um, it's a good question. I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> so he's at St. Crea, though, it was one of the ports of, of Corinth. That's where he took the vow, shaved off his hair, and then they sail on. He gets to Ephesus, he goes in and visits, reasons with them, but he's in a hurry. He's on his way to Jerusalem to keep a feast. Uh, I'm not even sure which one he's, he's thinking of at this point. Uh, so uh, he just says he wants to make sure to get there for the coming feast in Jerusalem. One of the major feasts, there's opportunities in Jerusalem. Again, people say, see, he's still keeping Jewish law. No, he's taking advantage of Jewish times. <laughs> he wants to get there because at Pentecost, there was a lot going on, right? There's a lot of Jews there he can teach. If this is for Passover, there's a lot of Jews he can teach. If this is for the in-gathering, there's a lot of Jews he can teach there. So he's trying to get there. And maybe keeping this feast will be the end of where his vow is as well. A lot of times that would be associated with that. So I will come back, God willing, and he sailed from Ephesus. I appreciate that as well. James teaches about that, and Paul does often in practice. If it's God's will, I'll return. My desire is to be here, but God's the one who knows the future. So I don't make promises without saying if this is what God wants. Uh, that is not a cop-out. Uh, I hear that a lot in some cases. Well, God didn't want me to, so I didn't. Well, no, you didn't want to. <laughs> That's not, that don't use, don't blame God. Uh, but if you were impeded from going, if there's something that kept you from going, then God wasn't willing it happened. But he lands at Caesarea, goes up and greets the church, and then goes to Antioch. Caesarea is a port close to Jerusalem, so he's got some travel still, but he goes up from there to encourage the church with all that's been going on. 
and heads back to Antioch where they left on this journey. I've gone a little bit over time, but thank you for indulging me. Uh, and prayerfully next week we will begin at verse 23 of chapter 18. It's really connected more with the events in chapter 19. It's the beginning of this final uh, missionary ver uh, journey. There will be another journey still, but uh, the end of that one. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for those who are online with us. In just a moment, we'll finish out with a word of prayer. Uh, and God willing, we'll be back on Sunday together. Let us pray. Our great God, we are so thankful. We're, I know I'm often more thankful than I realize. I know that we, when we sit and take a moment to consider all the good that we have each day, how thankful that makes us. Our food, our places, our roof above our heads, endless options to give us not only what we need, but often what we want at a moment's notice. The ability to be here with our transportation, the health that we have to be here without too much inconvenience. Lord, help us in our thankfulness and our gratitude to be able to share what we have, to look out for those who need a meal, to look out for those who need clothing and the weather, for those who are not as easily able to move and transport themselves or be transported, help us, Lord, to take this gratitude and the time we have together and carry it around with us and back to each of those people who we know who need our encouragement. Help us, Lord, to all be your ministering servants, to minister and serve one another with reminders, with words, with acts of thoughtfulness, acts of bearing one another's burden. Help us, Lord, to be active and never complacent. Help us not always to think that if someone needs something that they'll speak up, so help us, Lord, to encourage that within ourselves. But help us, Lord, simply to serve and encourage all the time so that those who are discouraged may receive that from you through us and that those who are in need of someone bearing a burden with them will receive that through your son's strength as we fulfill your word. Help us, Lord, to be filled with your light. Help us to be like the positive aspects of the Christians we read about in the book of Acts. Help us to be bold and help us to live our life in such a way that it is very obvious what kind of people we are. Help us to learn the lessons of some of those same people in these books that we read. Help us to learn the lessons of their less than stellar behavior. Help us, Lord, to look to you as our source of truth. We pray that you bless us and you give us the strength that we need. And we know that you delight to give. In your son Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen.